pro-life leaders are speaking out after FX premiered the AKA Jane Roe documentary, which included a so-called deathbed confession from Norma McCorvey, in which she claimed she was paid by pro-life groups to say things she did not believe about opposition to abortion. McCorvey, who died in 2017, was the Jane Roe in the landmark 1973 Supreme Court case Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion nationwide, though McCorvey never ultimately did procure an abortion. This is my deathbed confession. <laughs> These two attorneys were looking for a plaintiff to help overturn the Texas abortion laws. That was Roe v. Wade. Um, Norma McCorvey, a.k.a. Jane Roe. While McCorvey was originally a prominent abortion advocate, she eventually converted to Christianity, became a pro-life figure, and then entered the Catholic Church in 1998. Pro-life leaders were quick and vocal to respond to the release of the FX documentary, saying Norma's portrayal didn't match up with the Norma they knew. Abby Johnson, who says she spoke to McCorvey days before her death, writes, her many years as a dedicated pro-life advocate was not a lie. Her tearful conversation, which I will keep private with me days before her death, was not a lie. The hours she spent praying in front of abortion facilities was not a lie. Her life with Christ was not a lie. The abortion industry is a lie. And Janet Morana of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign wrote in the Christian Review she met McCorvey in 1995 during her conversion to Christianity. Morana writes, quote, Norma was exploited as a young woman by pro-abortion attorneys, and she was exploited at the end of her life by this filmmaker and whoever was backing him financially. That breaks my heart. But whatever she said in this documentary or appeared to say through deceptive editing does not shake my certainty that Norma's desire to protect children in the womb was not an act. Joining us now is Jason Jones, a film producer and pro-life leader who personally knew Norma McCorvey. He joins us via Skype from Hawaii. Jason, welcome back to the show. I never had the privilege of meeting Norma. So first off, tell us about the Norma McCorvey that you knew. Well, Catherine, thanks for having me on your show. And to know Norma, to know Miss Norma, was a real privilege. She was a convert to the Catholic faith like I am, an adult convert. But she, had a com she was comfortable in her faith like a cradle Catholic. She had the best sense of humor. You would never spend any time with Miss Norma, and, and, and she would always have you laughing. She'd always be making jokes. She, had, um, she was a very complex person, but also very transparent. Most of us have affectations that we'll put on. Um, if, if we're angry, if we're confused, we'll hide it. Miss Norma would let you know how, how, how she felt. And that's why so many of us who were her close friends when we heard uh, about this documentary and what they, what they claimed that she said, we all laughed. I mean, I knew I laughed and said, of course she, did. she said that. Um, that. That was Miss Norma, but mm -hmm. it, it was not a lie. Of course, she was, she was uh, very committed and very pro-life and, and a very devout Catholic. Jason, as you mentioned, Norma was a convert to Catholicism, such as yourself. Her Catholic conversion was barely mentioned in this film, though her Christian conversion was. But what can you, Jason, tell us about Norma's faith life? Well, I think what, what most struck me as somebody who uh, is an adult convert uh, always kind of felt alien, especially early on in my conversion, as someone who was raised with no religion uh, and, and uh, mm -hmm a broken family. I did not feel comfortable in Catholic settings. And what I always noticed with Norma was that she had a familiarity with her faith. She wore her faith like somebody who was a cradle Catholic. And she didn't feel the need, like a lot of converts, to put on this affectation that they're something they're not. She was just always Norma. And uh, she, uh, mm -hmm. you know, one time after she first heard my story, she took me aside and comforted me and was very empathetic. And she had an empathy that only somebody who experienced a lot of pain in life could have. And um, I think that's what the document, as a filmmaker, what the docu the two things that struck me when I was watching this documentary, one was how, how much I missed my friend. It was kind of hard just to um, not just want to look, in, listen, look at Norma and listen to Norma's voice and hear her voice. But then I realized they missed a big opportunity. She was a very complex person. She wrestled with mental illness. 
And you could tell that the filmmakers got a glimpse of this complexity, but they chose not to, to tell the true story of Miss Norma. Uh, like Janet Varana said in her, her statement, the abortion industry was there to use her when she was young. They used her in death. But we were the ones who were her friends and were with her during her life. Mm -hmm. Jason, to that point, did pro-lifers take advantage of Norma during her life from your perspective? No, you know, we didn't intentionally take advantage of her, but I think we learned something in the 90s. Uh, it was in the 90s that we started having people tell their stories. I started in the pro-life movement in, in 1989, and it wasn't until 2000 that I first publicly shared uh, that I was responsible for an abortion. That was 11 years into the movement. Mm -hmm. So I think we really were starting to encourage people to share their personal stories, but we weren't sensitive to maybe um, their brokenness. And so I think we were naive. Mm -hmm. But as a movement, as we began to understand that Norma was struggling, uh, we, we became better at in trying to work with Norma and let her express herself without doing it so in a way that would hurt her. Where with the abortion industry, we see that they target her when she was young and vulnerable. They abandoned her in her life. And then they were there again to use her after she passed away. And I see this like the wisdom of Solomon when the two uh, women were fighting over the child. And Solomon said, I will divide, you know, I'll cut this child in half and give you each a half. And, and if the abortion industry wants to cut Miss Norma in half, who is a very beautiful, complex person, well, then I would say let them have her because we don't want to, we don't want to engage in a public battle. We don't want to dissect Miss Norma. We loved her and she was our friend. And I think it's just, it was shameful for her to be used in this way. Mm. Jason, you are a film producer yourself. Just so our viewers know, you were an executive producer on Bella, for example. Uh, from that perspective, what do you make of the filmmakers releasing this documentary three years after Norma's death? And was it fairly produced? No, I mean, clearly they have an agenda, right? The Supreme Court's about to, a ruling is going to come down in the coming weeks on abortion, maybe the biggest since Roe v. Wade. We have an important election year. This film has an agenda. And as a filmmaker who I, I make films, and when we make films, our goal is that people leave the theater having an, uh, an elevated understanding of the beauty of the human person. But we don't want to be propagandists. You know, you choose a story that, that works as an exemplification. And this wasn't even good propaganda. Uh, the reality is you could see glimpses of the real Norma and her struggles in this film, and she's a very interesting person. And I, you know, now I'm inspired. I would hope to see somebody makes a documentary on Miss Norma that shows the beautiful, complex person she is. I mean, I think the real story that and it could have been Miss Norma's battle with mental illness, how tragic it is that a young woman, a young woman, not a young lawyer, a young woman who had been abused physically and sexually and had suffered and struggled in so many ways, was poor and vulnerable. And then even if you're pro-abortion, you could see how tragic it was that this poor young woman became the center of the most controversial Supreme Court decision in U.S. history, and it was all weighing on her shoulders and how that impacted her. That's where the really interesting story could have been, and that and uh, that's the movie, that, the documentary they could have made. And I think FX missed a great—they uh, had a great chance to make a beautiful story and tell the truth, but instead they made a— a cheap hit job, and, and I was really worried it was going to be a hit job on the pro-life movement. And you watched it, Catherine. When I watched it, it was actually worse. It was clearly a hit job on Miss Norma, and they're trying to muddy her legacy so that her name can't be used uh, to defend children and women from the violence of abortion. You bring, you bring such a powerful perspective to this conversation, Jason. And I, I do want to note this for our viewers. We did reach out to FX for comment, but did not hear back by show recording time. Jason Jones, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on.